The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Today we're going to be chatting with an electrical engineer about designing for space and other planets, including real life ion engines, like those that propel the TIE fighters in Star Wars. TIE stands for Twin Ion Engine. Star Wars is a podcast for Star Wars fans looking to connect real world science, technology, and fields of study to the galaxy far, far away. We'll end up talking to psychologists about deprogramming the Mandalorian, astronomers about hiding in asteroid fields, and even an artisan cheesemaker about what you can do with blue milk. I'm Melissa Miller. And I'm James Floyd, and we're both crazy about Star Wars and science. Ready, Melissa? Punch it. We have with us Justin Gagne, who supported the development of the navigation system for the Mars helicopter, Ingenuity. Hey, Justin, welcome to the show. Hi, James. Hi, Melissa. Can you tell us a bit about what you do and how you got into your field? And then we can chat about some examples of how your field overlaps with Star Wars, like ion engines and other designs for life in space and on other planets. Well, my background is in hardware design, circuit boards and things like that. And some of the stuff I've been working on recently is uh, related to how to use chips in space that weren't designed for that environment. I kind of got into it by chance, actually. Somebody uh, from an organization that does a lot of things in space wanted to use some more recent technology to do some more advanced capabilities. We, we have to be very hush-hush here about the name of certain organizations and, and companies. So we're, we're going to keep it on the down low. So don't spread the word. I mean, spread the word about our podcast and about Justin being here. We're talking about the Mars helicopter. So that's obviously very cool. I can tell you that the components that they've been using in space, the reason they're older technology is because they have to design for the radiation environment. And so it's stuff from the early 90s. Right. And so back then it was, you know, like single thread power PCs, 200 megahertz, 10 watts. And um, they'd really like to use more modern stuff that's small, faster, lower power, especially when you want to get more autonomy in space. It really needs to sort of have the brains to figure it out on the spot instead of sending everything back to Earth for processing. Oh. Is, isn't 10 watts like the wattage on an easy bake oven? That's a 40 watt bulb. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's four times as powerful as as what they want to send into space. We could send easy bake ovens into space and they'd have more power, but well, they'd also require more power. Chips don't like to get up to 350 you know, Fahrenheit. That's kind of toasty. I definitely it's good for cookies, this, not good for chips. I definitely remember hearing a stat at some point. I never fact checked it, but that the Teddy Ruxpin that I coveted back in the 80s had more uh, advanced technology than what got manned to the moon in the 1960s. So, yeah, yeah. There's one part of the helicopter that they just sent up that has Bob, Dr. Bob Balaram, who's the chief engineer for the project, said this that that one processor has more compute power on it than everything JPL has sent to space uh, before. Everything else they've put in space at all. Wow. Um, yeah, it's That's a big awesome. leap. This is like the, the PlayStation 5 as opposed to a whole string of ColecoVisions. Exactly like that, <laughs> except in space. Can you tell us a little bit about your Star Wars sort of origin story, how long you've been a Star Wars fan, and whether or not that influenced your career path at all? Oh, boy. Yeah, so I started watching that, of course, when I was a kid. Couldn't get enough. I only had the you know four, five, and six uh, back then. They didn't have the prequels yet. They didn't have any of the other stuff. All engineers have some interest in space that never never goes away. I didn't get into it very directly for like my the first twenty years of my career. It was only recently that I uh, was able to get into that play in that arena. It's funny how things uh, meander, though. The background I developed away from things in space, partly related to automotive. You know, they need high reliability for automotive, and that's kind of what they were looking for for space as well. So, so, so you'd say that space is really your final frontier. I hope I'm not done yet. <laughs> okay, good. Good answer. So what in the Star Wars movies is really connected to your field of expertise? What do you see represented there? Well, so one example of something that did cross over from Star Wars into real life is the ion engine. The 
they were talking about that in the 70s. And up until recently, they'd only used uh, combustion and, and compressed gas type propellants in space, um, which you get a nice impulse from that's good for liftoff to get off the surface of Earth and reach uh, escape velocity. But if you are going from here to distant planets, um, it's not too hard to use up your propellant. And it turns out that ionizing molecules, and one of the propellants you're using now for this is water, if you ionize it, and you can accelerate it with an electric field and basically send it at very high velocity out of the, the thruster, if you use water, the other one they use is uh, xenon gas molecules. Okay, yeah, so just, just to get this straight, you're, you're shooting ions. How do you ionize something, but, but then, then, then basically shoot it out of the thruster? So you're just, it's like you're, you're letting a pin out of a balloon or a little pinhole and it's just pushing you forward? Or, Well, um, remember that uh, it's like a static electric effect where you have, it's basically charged particles. They, they take the electrons off of something like a water molecule or off of a xenon atom. And once you take the electrons off, it becomes very ch highly charged. And so if you put it between two metal plates, one that's very positive and one that's very negative, it will accelerate toward the, um, the negative one because it's, and be pushed away from the positive one. And they put a hole in the negative plate. So as it approaches the negative plate, it just passes right through it. Now, the, tr the trick is though, that once it gets past the negative plate, it could essentially come back and, and hit the plate. So what they the, th the other thing they have to do is they have to have a, in addition to the positive stream, they need to have a negative stream that recombines after it leaves the craft so that it doesn't get attracted back to the craft and, and sort of cancel out that momentum gain that you generated. Generating electricity to ionize the molecules and everything, that's very highly efficient as opposed to compressed gases, which have a lower velocity. The part these are good at, um, though, is different than what you have the conventional propellants. It's basically, it's very, the energy level is very low, but you can leave it on for a long time at high efficiency. So instead of a burst, you basically like, you might leave it on for an hour or a day in order to do a course correction, you know, between planets. So, so TIE fighters, you have to warm them up first. You, and, and once you get going, you can't really turn too easily yet. It's, yeah, they, it's, you don't have a good turning radius. But when you're talking about, you know, astronomical units, let's see, the distance from the sun to the moon is about half a million kilometers. And that's, that's really close in at space terms. Even the, at the speed of light, it takes, what is it, like an hour to get from Jupiter to Earth. Wow. So but, what are ion engines being used uh, for in the real world? Yeah. So they, the other really big advantage of those is that they can make them really small as well as power efficient, which is great for small satellites. Uh, you know, some traditional satellites, they would spend 10 years. It may cost a billion dollars and take a, the rocket may also cost a billion dollars. And they'll, you know, launch that into space and, and use it for a long time. Um, but by the time it's up there and by the time of the end of its service life, the stuff that's on there is fairly old technology, right? And so cameras advance and sensors advance. And so one of the things that they're doing now is, you know, even universities are sending up small sats now, CubeSats, right? They even tried up sending cell, just cell phones. They instrumented the cell phones and sent them up on weather balloons to the upper atmosphere. But the idea is you can take some of these latest sensor technologies, pair them up with something that maybe isn't going to last a decade, but only last a couple months or a year or something like that, send it up and collect some real science data. But if you're going to do that, it can't be the size of a school bus. It has to be very compact. The standard unit for a CubeSat is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Wow. Which is actually, it's the size of the container the professor was looking at. Uh, the container was from like the container store, I think, or Ikea, something like that. And so there are always a multiple of that unit and that your propulsion will f and your energy and your um, attitude correction. So you don't like spin uncontrollably in space. All that stuff is, you know, fits in a one U or a three U or a six U satellite. And, and if you put little holes on the bottom and studs on the top, can you, can you stack cube sats like Lego? They're not quite that modular, but they want to be. Cool. It's interesting. Yeah. That's the other thing that's different is that instead of being a highly custom one-off thing, there's a lot more standardization, which is also making it easier for the universities and, and more smaller organizations to start setting them up. And they're you know, talking about doing swarms of satellites and things like that, which is you know, not because of that, but related to that. There's another issue that they're running into 
with um, space junk. So uh, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the, the pictures of it, but uh, there is so much debris in orbit around Earth that it's actually hazardous to the other things that are supposed to be operating in orbit. Well, and I think it only comes up in The Empire Strikes Back, but they talk about Star Destroyers dumping their garbage before they head to hyperspace. That's how, you know, the Millennium Falcon escapes, but that also has to add up. It may seem like a tiny little drop in the ocean, but it it does add up and can pose a serious hazard, I assume. What is your next move? Well, if they follow standard Imperial procedure, they'll dump their garbage before they go to light speed, and then we just float away. Get the rest of the garbage. They're tracking each piece. Uh, I forget the minimum size. Each piece that's larger than one inch, because wow. that's enough to take out you know, a solar, solar panel or even uh, destroy a satellite if it's big enough. Yeah, I remember reading about astronaut Michael Collins back in the Apollo days. He dropped a camera in space and it was, <laughs> you know, it's that's bigger than an inch. And, you know, could you imagine that his camera, if it hasn't burned up yet, you know, floating around and smacking into somebody's satellite, but swarms of satellites, that that sounds like, uh, like swarms of TIE fighters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, yeah. I remember learning that the ISS had to do like a, you know, shelter in place sort of thing almost a couple of years ago because there was a piece of space junk that was going to come within a couple miles of them. And that's well within, you know, we're concerned about it radius and mm. and how it was, you know, just sort of wondering what was going to happen. And then it passed passed them by. But it's just going to keep getting worse and worse, it sounds like, just when we're leaving space junk up there. Yeah, and there is a lot of new attention on organizations being responsible responsible for deorbiting things. Basically, have a plan decommissioning so that they come back. Uh, you see that a lot with the big launches and things like that. But they're also doing it for small sats too. It's a little bit of extra cost because you have to. You can't just use all your propellant up to the very end of the mission. You have to save some to slow down and get to force a reentry. Um, if it's a high enough orbit, if it's low enough and it's a little bit, if it's in starting to touch the atmosphere, you get enough drag that eventually it'll drop anyway. But anything in a middle or high orbit needs that. Wow. Now I'm imagining Coruscant with, you know, hundreds and thousands of satellites and other, and tons of flights going in and out and pretty much having no place for space junk to land on the surface without hitting somebody's house. I guess Coruscant space junk patrol. Yeah. Yeah. They ever show any sort of like field yeah. around Coruscant, you know, the way there is around Scarif or something like that, that would prevent that. Sorry, Justin, I feel like you were about to say something anyway. But. Well, the other thing that they are doing is they're doing experiments on how to clean up space junk. Like I saw something, I think it was a university project, I think. They sent up a small sat with a harpoon on it and thrusters so that they could go catch space debris and deorbit it intentionally. So there's, uh, I wonder if Coruscant has, uh, they've got a, basically a cleaning crew that, yeah, um, it's a, you know, harpoons are good. So is it a giant space vacuum cleaner, like mega made space balls? <laughs> oh, suck, <yeah>. suck, suck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've been talking about you know, space junk. What other uh, factors are there in the environment of space that uh, you have to deal with when, when designing for space? Well, one of the really interesting ones that doesn't show up a lot in sci-fi that I've seen, even in The Martian, which was, you know, which was kind of like a love letter to engineers and to scientists because it has so much accurate material in it, didn't talk about the, the, the radiation part of it. And the radiation in space is pretty harsh. The Earth is really nice in that it has a really nice magnetic field, which diverts a lot of the space radiation around it or shunts it into the, the poles where you get the aurora borealis. And if the stuff that makes it through the magnetic field of Earth, usually when it hits the top of the atmosphere, then it reacts with that. And so very little is left once it get, you know, once you get down to the surface of Earth where the air is dense. It turns out there is a little bit. It's about 14 neutrons per square centimeter per second. This where this comes from, actually, it starts with cosmic rays and gamma rays. Those, because they aren't charged, they don't interact with the magnetic field. And so they pass through that. But then once they hit the upper atmosphere, they maybe they hit an oxygen atom or a, a nitrogen atom. And then when that happens, it may shatter the molecule. It's technically a, chain rea it's a nuclear chain reaction. It's not a lot of energy. What will happen is it'll, it'll break apart that atom into different subatomic particles, muons and neutrons and protons and electrons, gamma rays sometimes. 
And each one of those will have less energy and then it'll interact with something else in the atmosphere. And, you know, with less and less energy each time, it's kind of like uh, if you've seen somebody play pool and they, the very first shot where the, uh, when they break and all the balls go off in different directions, but they all have lower, lower energy than, than the initial collision. That's kind of what happens. So you get a little bit down on earth. Um, if you get a chance, I recommend looking at a video of something called a cloud chamber. It was something developed in the uh, 1900s. It's a super saturated alcohol in air. And even the slightest disturbance causes it to condense and it's, con and it's a cloud. And so as something as small as a, a, an alpha particle passes through it, it, ca it causes a condensation trail. And so you can just, you can physically see the, the radiation. There's one at the Griffith Observatory. That's where I happened to notice it first. And wow. I looked it up afterwards. You can, you can actually see radiation yeah. happening by, by alcohol condensing. And you know, to our, our fans at home that uh, like alcohol, here's something practical you can do with it besides drink. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like we'll have to have some links and graphics and stuff like that up in our show notes this time around yeah. to make sure everyone can keep up with is some of these ideas. I certainly, uh, I'm mm -hmm. going to have to Google a couple of things after this. So you have this little bit of, uh, you know, radiation on earth. And so when that hits a, a piece of electronics, it can cause, you know, the ones and zeros to flip state and become a, a zero or a one in, instead of a one or a zero. You know, if a cell phone reboots, that's not too big a deal usually. And you may not even notice uh, if you're not using it, but if you're in autonomous driving car and you're going at 65 miles an hour on the freeway and it reboots, you don't want to have an accident, right? And so they care about it. And for those high reliability applications, so that's, that's part of how I got into this. Well, can't you just um, get out of the car, turn it off, turn it back on again. And while you're going 65 miles an hour, <laughs> how did I know that turn it off and turn it on again was going to come up sometime <laughs> in this episode? <laughs> I, I maybe hit it to a couple times. Oh, I, literally really have hard that. I literally have that on my notes. Does banging the millennium <laughs> Falcons roof actually re-engage the hyperdrive? <laughs> Cause you're talking about an autonomous thing, you know, an autonomous the, car breaking the down on the term, side of the road. <laughs> yeah. The technical term for that is percussive maintenance. Oh, I like that. Han Solo seemed to know his percussive maintenance. So. Yes. <laughs> I, and that's the thing about things in space is that you can't pull over. You can't go to the service station. Once you launch it, it really has to take care of itself. So they have to do other things like be able to reset, right? And f flush out any errors and recover from it gracefully without ending the mission. And sometimes that means putting two or three or more units in parallel. So if one dies, the other ones take over. Kind of like having multiple astromechs in your Queen's Royal Starship to fix things. And, you know, if some of them get shot off, that's okay. We still got more. That's right. Yes. You always want to have spare astromechs around. Yeah. I'm curious now if your experience with technology, up, updating technology from the 90s, you said that used to be in, in used in space to, to now if that somehow you can explain why in the prequels, the technology seemed much more advanced than in the original trilogy. <laughs> yeah, that one, I, I can't explain that one. Sorry. I, I, that's okay. I think I just have to finally accept that it was because gra computer graphics at the time, they were having a little bit too much fun maybe at ILM. <laughs> I think that's a more plausible explanation. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say just the rebels got really, really bad hand-me-downs. They got the stuff that was, you know, 30 years older than the prequel era stuff. And, and so mm. that's why their computers are, are so shoddy and their, their hardware is uh, less <laughs> graceful than, than the, the stylish era of, I don't know. Yeah. And then again, you look at cars now versus mm -hmm. the cars of the 1930s and forties and you're like, wow, our, ours don't have any style to them. I will say the one thing about the, the older space uh, semiconductors is that they were really reliable. I mean, you think about Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, uh, they're still running, right? And I'm not convinced that you know, the latest stuff we're talking about sending up would last that long. The idea is to send up things you know, more frequently and coll you know, collect you know, more science and more and more science every time you send something up. Is there a communications delay between Earth and Mars? A communications disruption can mean only one thing, invasion. Yeah, so even when they are close together, uh, so they're on different orbits, right? Because there are different distances from the sun. Uh, Venus is a little bit closer to Earth, so it has a shorter year. And 
Mars has a longer year. They uh, pass each other about every two years. That's the launch opportunity. And so the last time they passed each other was uh, last summer. That's why there was a, a flurry of launches by the United States and in China. That's that's your opportunity because you want to do when they're really close so it doesn't take so much time and so you don't need as much fuel to get there. And then the uh, it took from, I think it was June-ish of last year until about February of this year for the Perseverance rover to land. And so some time has, has passed. And I think that the time delay for the signals now that Mars has moved on is about eight minutes. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that later on in the year, I guess about another nine months from now-ish, whenever Mars is on the opposite side from the sun from Earth, there will be no communication at all because you you can't pass signals through the sun. It generates a staggering amount of that, that much energy. The noise levels are off the chart, you know, for any kind of calm system. So you just have to wait it out. Yeah. So I'm curious then if you have any ideas of how in Star Wars they could communicate with each other when they're on completely different worlds and traveling. Oh, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's some interesting things happening. I, I don't know if you're familiar with quantum mechanics and ent- quantum entanglement. I have um, heard both of those terms, but that's I, I, yeah. I kind of understand the, the basic idea of quantum entanglement, but uh, go for it. Yeah. So the idea, and it's completely unintuitive for most people, um, but the idea is that if you can cause these two uh, elements to develop quantum entanglement, then what one does affects the other. Kind of like a teeter-totter, right? If you push down on one end of the teeter-totter, the other end goes up. And you can't manipulate one side without affecting the other side, except they've cut the teeter-totter and one end is on earth and the other one end is a million miles away and they still interact immediately, right? Without a time delay. So there's some security applications, but there's also communication applications that they're interested in. So I do kind of wonder if that's the kind of thing that they are using in Star Wars and we just haven't heard about it yet. Wow. So better than midichlorians. We haven't discovered those yet either. (laughs) Just as well. I wish they'd never been invented. (laughs) Quantum entanglement um, allows you kind of to point to point communication, but um, in order to talk to somebody at the other end, you have to give them the the matching piece essentially, right? Yes. Yes. That is a very good point. And I don't really have an explanation how you could talk to someone you hadn't set up communication plans with ahead of time. Well, that's interesting, though, because maybe that's how, you know, the rebels can communicate with the rebels. Like, I don't remember in Star Wars a whole lot of times where signals were intercepted, you know, which you'd think would be possible tapped into or whatever. So maybe that's it is that they've got different. They've got a black teeter totter and a white teeter totter. And you can't you can't hear the other one's signals without sending a whole bunch of bothins in or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. With it, with interstellar communication, that, that may be the case. Remember though, on Hoth, when the probe droid uh, was communicating and they picked up the signal, you know, it was kind of garbled, but that was using radio communication. So they must've had, and you had the big antennas on it too. So it must've had, maybe they had an orbiter or something that followed it in order to, to pick up the link. You know, going for a deep dive here in the new Jedi Order books, the the um, Yuuzhan Vong had these things called villips that were basically an organic point to point communicator that that maybe they use quantum entanglement, but in my mind, I always envision them as like giant clams or oysters or something. But you could kind of touch them, and then they would change into the shape of the uh, the person at the other end. So it was, it was kind of like the the Wakandan holography. Uh, stuff with vibranium, uh, but it looked more like a seashell. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I kind of wonder if there, if you think about entanglement, right. And you think about biology and genetics and DNA and mitosis and meiosis, those things where the, the double helix will split and then form a new uh, double helix, right. If you could, if some organism were able to tap into that and the mechanics of how it did it included quantum entanglement, because it's splitting things and then and then creating new things that are duplicating it as a basis for communication. Maybe if you could commu- had a way of interacting with that organism to tap into its quantum entangled um, siblings, maybe that would be a way to communicate. 
Wait a minute. That, I think you just defined what midichlorians are. Oh, no. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> At least we came to it logically somehow. I like that, though. Maybe, I, maybe I that'll help a, me. I think of a midichlorian more like a mitochondria, right? Because a mitochondria in a cell is, it's basically another cell that's almost a bacteria. And the, yeah. the special thing it does is it converts sugar into electricity, which just sounds like a really odd thing, right? And you get things like electric eels where they can align their, their charges to build up a high voltage so that they can stun prey, which is just bizarre, right? Yeah. That such right. a thing is even possible. Midichlorians don't sound so strange after you, you know, think about that. Yeah. On our previous episode, we interviewed Angela Zomplis about um, her work on bacteria in extreme environments. And I can't believe we never considered asking her about metachlorians. So that's a follow-up question. Um, that sort of symbiotic, you know, maybe living within you um, sort of bacteria. That's interesting. Yeah. So what are some of the, the different missions and how they affect what you can build in, in the environment of space? or in the environment on Mars? So all, all the environments are different. Um, I once asked uh, somebody, well, give me a generic description of what the environment is so that we can you know, plan some requirements to build something. And they said, well, it, there isn't a generic set. It, it completely depends on where you're going. So there are some places like Mars where there's a thin atmosphere. It shields a little bit from radiation, not a ton, but it's, it's a little bit better than deep space. And you've got a planet on one side, so that cuts it in half right there. And the temperatures are fairly cold on Mars. The, hot, the summer daytime high is about minus 25 Celsius or so. And then the nighttime low is closer to minus 170, I think. And then you've got other places like Venus with an extremely dense atmosphere, which is really great for shielding radiation. But once you get down deep in the atmosphere, the temperature is really high, hot, hot enough to melt solder, right? And so whatever you send down there is not going to last very long. And then one of my favorite places that I'd really like to send stuff is uh, Europa, because it's a huge challenge. Uh, Europa, it's a moon around Jupiter. And it's got an ice shell around a liquid core. The reason they know that is they have pictures from Hubble that show a plume emanating from it. And they, they were actually, they confirmed it independently that it, there actually is essentially water vapor coming off, off of it. So there could be life there. Really cool place to go visit. The, the unpleasant neighborhood part of it, or the part that makes it really difficult, uh, is that there's another moon around Jupiter called Io, and it has a volcano on it. And this is a volcano that's enormous. And it's spewing out sulfur dioxide, except it's leaving the moon entirely and going into uh, the space around Jupiter. And Jupiter is being a gas giant, has a lot of gravity and a very strong, extremely strong magnetic field, not as strong as the sun, but very powerful. And it's like a nuclear accelerator. It's uh, just like Ghostbusters, right? Except on a bigger scale. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's speeding these things up and you get these high speed charged particles. So the radiation levels there are much higher than other places in the universe really? in the solar system. I mean, so most of the solar system, you can get by with like 5k rad. You, you design for maybe 20k rad for Europa. Even if you shield it really, really well uh, and you define it as a really short mission, you still need hundreds of K rad, ideally like a mega rad of radiation resistance. Right. And so there's very few things that are, able to tolerate that. And so the circuits, they degrade quickly. Uh, it even degrades materials. Like in, in the presence of, of that kind of radiation, iron will turn into cobalt because when you bombard it with neutrons and protons, eventually the nucleus starts, it gains mass and it becomes something else. And so your nice crystal structure of iron becomes a, you get this uh, residue essentially of cobalt that doesn't fit in and it sort of weakens the whole thing. Not that they would send iron. That's not a very practical thing. <laughs> it's exactly like you can get a free cobalt coating, though. <laughs> right. You it's actually a problem. This is something that they have to deal with on naval vessels with a nuclear power, is that the steam uh, systems, the pipes and plumbing and everything, part of the iron pipes gets converted to cobalt. And so periodically they have to go and when they do maintenance, they have to worry about radioactive cobalt in the system periodically come on now you did that walk, on purpose <laughs> can you put that the, 
the 20 K rad in perspective for me? Like what is, what is oh, the radiation yeah. you get in an X-ray? What is the radiation of a nuclear blast? Uh, so on earth, the radiation that a person experiences over the course of a year uh, would typically be less than 0.5 rad, right? So it's like a thousand, it's less than a thousandth of what you'd get in deep space in a year. And then on top of that, though, sort of the background level in deep space missions isn't particularly high. One of the things that adds a lot, especially when you're in the inner solar system, is solar flares and, and emissions from the sun. You get these, the flares will emit a burst of radiation and you may get like a 20K rad event in a matter of seconds where that you get a huge surge of, of radiation. So that's what, when they talk about sending people to Mars, that's the one thing that I would worry about that I haven't really seen solved yet is how do you protect them sufficiently that they make it to Mars and they don't get radiation sickness before they even get there? That is something that is obviously very important for the going to Mars is making sure our, yeah. our astronauts can actually get there without dying from radiation. So that's, um, I really want to know from the Star Wars universe, how do they get around it? Because if they have an ion engine equivalent that we can just borrow, that would be fantastic. Yeah, that's a good question. That doesn't ever really come up. I mean, in general, in Star Wars, I feel like they're pretty blasé about moving from place to place and being able to breathe everywhere they go and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, they only wear this like flimsy little mask when they're, you know, outside on that asteroid and outside on the Star Destroyer on Ex- Exegol. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'm sure the answer to this will be yes, but is there anything else we should uh cover here in terms of how your field of expertise overlaps with Star Wars? Oh, there was one other thing uh, that I enjoy uh, in particular, and that is um, the growth of autonomy for space exploration, right? Uh, So if you think about Mars, there is no GPS on it. How do you figure out where you are and how you move from place to place. And traditionally what they would do is they would send an orbiter first to take pictures of the, of the surface and then send a rover down, well, a lander first. It's obvious it doesn't even move around. And then you'd send a, a rover that can move around and it radios back to the orbiter. The orbiter you know, takes pictures of it as it's down there so they can figure out where it is. And the, the rover also, once it's down there, it would take pictures of its environment travel a short distance and then take more pictures and send those back to earth. And the scientists would say, okay, based on where you are now, go that way. Right. And then it would move a little bit more and take some more pictures. That's so it's kind of very like much me on vacation. I, I mean, move a little <laughs> bit, take some more pictures, move a little bit more, take some more pictures, drives, drives my family nuts. Yeah. You're probably my... not worth $85 billion, <laughs> million. Dollars, Wait, million, billion. It must be billion. billion. Just, it's just million. It was just a small million. Issue. Okay. You're yeah. not, sorry. You're probably not worth $85 million, James. <laughs> <laughs> my spouse was commenting actually on the way the, uh, the Rover and the helicopter were taking pictures of each other. It's like a couple on vacation. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to go look at that. See, on my vacations, it's mostly pictures of my husband because I take the pictures. So it doesn't end up being Mm -hmm. 50-50. So Mm -hmm. maybe ingenuity and perseverance have a better balance of that. Well, I think so far, perseverance has a lot more pictures of ingenuity than the other way around. Okay. So it tells you something, I guess. (laughs) But but how does how does you know taking all these pictures work for for ingenuity? Since you mentioned you oh, know, yeah. perseverance, it you know moves forward. The the orbiter says, "Yep, you move forward. Let's take some more pictures and then reorient with direction." But you know, obviously, you can't do that when you're flying. So there's the autonomy thing. So since there's no GPS and they need to know that they're going to land in a safe spot, what they did was they they drove the rover to a place and used the cameras on the rover to make sure it was all nice and flat and a safe landing, no big boulders that were going to or, or a slope or any, or hills or anything that are, where it's going to tip over. And they drove away. And then when the helicopter takes off and flies around, it uses cameras pointed at the ground and it watches the images moving underneath the helicopter as it's moving. It's tracking sort of the edges of the rocks and things like that as they move across to figure out where it's going and how to get back. That's called uh, terrain relative navigation. You watch as you pass by things to figure out where you're going. And so there's a, then that's what the now that's why the heavy they need the heavy processing is they have to process these images in real time and look for and do all the math to look for the edges of things to identify you know where the where this rock is between consecutive pictures. One of the things I really I think it would be cool for Europa. So they have lots of pictures around Mars to begin with, 
and they they have this their own version of terrain relative navigation that they use to land it because ordinarily they would aim for the big middle of a big crater because it's smooth and wide and it's easy to land there without crashing into something and then they would spend the next month driving out of the crater to get to something interesting to look at science wise on this latest landing they did something they used terrain relative navigation on the EDL maneuver which is entry descent and landing they figured out a target landing area and they used this terrain relative navigation to figure out if they were near the edge of the the landing area or if they were actually past it and so they would actually course correct as they were landing to hit the spot they wanted to go to where they wanted to land where it was safe that was yeah. the lander doing that itself the lander did that itself yeah they had wow. a, a shoebox size computing instrument to run the uh, algorithms to process the camera data to do that so the really thing that's interesting that I would love to do is to go is to bring some modern technology to Europa and during the end during the they don't call it entry just because there's no atmosphere there but it'd be the uh, deorbit descent and landing phase the DDL take pictures of the surface as they're landing pick out a safe spot on route and then divert to the safe spot so instead of having a priori knowledge of where they want to land pick it during the mission during the during the actual event i think that would be really impressive and that's a really tough challenge i'd love to tackle wow that that does sound really cool that, that and that kind of ties right into to star wars with the probe droids landing you know like on hoth it's like hey let's land near something interesting rather than oh we're in the middle of of a big snow desert let's let's go look in the mountains that's where people might be hiding so that's, that's really want- cool I'm also picturing every like landing party ever, you know, where they park on the other side of the planet and then move their really slow vehicles like dramatically across. Um, it seems like maybe they need this system of, I forget what the acronym was now. Science does love an acronym, right? But TRL, Terrain Relative Navigation. TRL. Terrain Relative yeah. Navigation. Whoever the landing party was for like the Battle of Naboo or whatever landed on the wrong side of the planet. They could use this, <laughs> so. Landing in Dagobah near Yoda's place that, that uh, right. Luke was really good at, at picking out the right spot to land. Or was it Yoda you know, right. Picking well, and I also feel like the Millennium Falcon certainly had some pretty rough landings where they could have, it could have been better. If the Millennium Falcon was able to land itself, uh, the ship might've been better off than it was <laughs> under uh, Han Solo and other captainage. You know, maybe that part of the, the Falcon just didn't warrant the attention that the other systems did. And they just, it had one, but it was broken and they just never bothered to fix it. Yeah. Makes I sense. Like <laughs> so instead they had to fix the landing gear like nine times. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, you know, you say you're an electrical engineer. What is the path that you took to becoming one? Like if somebody wanted to be an electrical engineer and then eventually work on cool space stuff, uh, what would they do? What did you do? There's, there's actually a lot of ways, paths to get there now. Um, for me, growing up, I love playing with Legos and I am really impressed with what they've come up with in the last many years with a Lego Technic set, I would have loved to have some of those. Um, there's just amazing stuff you can do with those and apply your creativity very quickly and building stuff. That Just that that's spatial understanding and problem solving that comes with that is extremely useful. You know, math aside, that kind of, the way of thinking about problems and trial and error, that's really the scientific method, right? There was, I did a lot of that uh, and building stuff as a kid. I did enjoy math and science and Toward the end of high school, I found out that there's this career called engineering where you could get to tinker and get paid for it, which I thought was really awesome. So that's what I studied in college and got a bachelor's in that. There's a shortage of those in the United States, worldwide, actually. Once you get a degree, if you're half decent at it, you can get a job. The unemployment rate's super low. I was interested in semiconductor physics, which I didn't actually use until four years ago when I got into into the radiation stuff. Your education doesn't end when you get a degree. That's just the end of the formal part. You learn on the job. It's it's life learning continuous, which is a ton of fun. A lot of different twists and turns, even within the same company, a lot of opportunities. And you know, I've worked with folks at JPL and I'll say this, and at, at my company too, it's not just about engineering. There's a lot of knowledge work out there. So if if physics isn't your cup of tea or mechanics or things like that, um, you can contribute in other ways too. Very cool. Is there any social media that our listeners can follow you on or ways to find out more about your projects? Well, uh, 
the uh, Perseverance rover actually has its own Twitter feed at NASA Persevere. All right. Cool. Sounds great. That wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our guest, Justin Gagne, and we want to thank all of you for listening. We are at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or Star Wars Ologies, that's Star Wars, O-L-O-G-I-E-S at gmail.com. Yeah, and make sure to check out our YouTube channel for screenshots from the movies, uh, parts that we talked about here today with Justin, and maybe we'll get some pictures of ingenuity and perseverance up on there as well. We are part of the Skywalking Network, where you can also find a variety of other great shows like Talking Apes, Classic Marvel Star Wars Comics, the Max FX Podcast, The Neverland Clubhouse, Resilient Squadron, Totally Tell Me Everything, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. You can find all of these shows at skywalkingnetwork.com. Tune in next time for our San Diego Comic-Con panel called The Science of Star Wars. James and I will be hosting some great guests along with the Fleet Science Center. And let us know if you think of any other topics or experts you'd like us to have on the show. Thanks for listening. And remember, no topic is off limits, even the taxation.